Amen. All right, Numbers chapter number 6. We, we started this last week. Again, the book of Numbers are getting ready to move out. Uh, they've been at Mount Sinai for approximately two years, somewhere along in that area to get everything. God gave them the law. Uh, God set up the tabernacle. They built the tabernacle, put it in use. He set up the Levitical priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood. He structured their military. When they get to the new land, they're going to have to go to war. And the first thing they did at Ai was they ran. Isn't that something? I'll tell you what, sometimes it takes war in in order to make a warrior. Uh, So it's one thing to train in the military, it's something else to learn to stick your head up and return suppressing fire uh, when you're under fire. Uh, So we find he's getting them ready to go. And one of the things he deals with here, he deals with the uh, Nazarite. Most of these verses down through 21 deal with the Nazarite vow. I want to go back uh, to the word Nazarite. It comes from a Hebrew word, Nazir, N-A-Z-I-R. And uh, we get that, and it means to be consecrated, separated, set aside for a purpose. So that's what a Nazarite was. Now, when he starts this out, he said, if a man or a woman, in verse number 2, when we think of Nazarites, we think of men. Women could be a Nazarite and have a Nazarite vow just like the men did. Same specifications on them. The same offerings are going to be offered. Everything's going to be consistent, male or female. It doesn't matter today if you're a man or a woman. You can be separated unto God. You can put your life and say, here am I, Lord, send me. Use me, Lord. And that's, that's what a Nazarite was. Uh, they did this uh, when they made a vow. Sometimes it was for a specific purpose in life. Sometimes it was for a set time in life. And then sometimes it was just a Nazarite for life. So we find several Nazarites in the Bible, the most notable in the Old Testament, a man by the name of Samson. Boy, Samson was a, he was a case to be dealt with. I'm going to tell you. Uh, Old Samson was something else. I'm making sure he got that on. Uh, he was a Nazarite. Let his locks grow. Let his hair grow. Now, at the end of the Nazarite's uh, vow, they shaved his locks off. I want to go back to the Old Testament. We see all the pictures of the long-haired prophets and all this stuff in there. Jews kept their hair cut. <laughs> Jewish men did not have long hair. Only the Nazarites were allowed to have long hair. You go to New Testament, it says that long hair on a man shames his head. Uh, see, so many of them today, they got the long flowing locks like a, a woman and shoulder length and all this. Uh, it's a shame for men to do that. They better be glad they weren't raised in my dad's household. Son, he, <laughs> my dad cut every hair had a hair on the block for years. They'd come down and sat under an old willow tree. Dad cut them all the same way, just like the military. He buzzed them off and gave them free haircuts. So we find the Nazarite, and he makes a vow. Verse number 3, we dealt with that. He'll separate himself, one, from wine and strong drink. Notice the differentiation between the two words. Wine in the Bible can be either fermented or non-alcoholic. When you're talking about wine, you're just simply talking about the fluid that comes out of that grape. Now, in order to make it alcoholic, then you've got to do something. Alcohol is not found naturally in nature. Nothing turns to alcohol. It turns to vinegar. Vinegar is acetic acid. So it, it'll turn acidic. That's why we've got vinegars that we use. Got some real good health benefits with that. Uh, Vinegar is good for you. Shouldn't drink it straight. You mix it with something and take a little bit, especially brown vinegar or uh, uh, what we call apple cider vinegar. All these things are good for you. But the Nazarite couldn't touch them. He said he's to separate himself from wine, from strong drink, from vinegar of wine and vinegar of strong drink 
neither shall he drink any liquor. The word liquor there doesn't mean it's alcoholic. The word liquid, liquor means when you liquefy something, all right? When you take the moisture out of it, that's, it just simply means liquid. We use liquor nowadays in a different uh, terminology, but uh, again, your uh, English language is constantly evolving. It's changing every day. The way we used to write is no longer acceptable. And, uh, you know, it puts a little red lines under your word processors. I just tell it to get a life. Hey, Amen. I still say in spite of instead of despite. I don't normally use that terminology. Uh, but anyway, we find that uh, your English language is evolving. But he also said no moist grapes or dried. What's a moist grape? That's a grape that's still got all of the moisture on the inside of it. You know, one of the best refreshing uh, uh, things you can have in the summertime is frozen grapes. Anybody ever eat them? You wash those grapes and put them in a bag and put them in a freezer and let them freeze. And when you put that thing in your mouth and bite into that, that juice has got ice in that juice. You're talking about refreshing. So they were to stay away from everything that had to do with the grape. Why? Because the grape gives the blood of the grape. The grape is a type of the blood of Christ. That's why you've got times in the Bible when it's non-alcoholic. Reason being, if it's always alcoholic, then that, that taints the blood of Christ in the New Testament with sin. That blood was pure blood. It was perfect blood. So we find here that he's to separate. Now, look at verse 4. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree from the kernel to the husk. Couldn't eat any of it. Had to completely abstain from anything that had to do with the grape tree. Now, verse number 5, all the days of the vow of his separation. Now, it said all the days of that vow. I said that sometimes it wasn't a vow for life. A man said, I'm going to give myself to God for five years or ten years in the strength of, uh, to serve God with that, and I'll be a Nazarite for that particular length of time. But then at the end of that time, you end the law of the Nazarite, and you've completed that vow. The Bible said if you make a vow to God, you better keep it. Tell God you're going to do something, then you need to do what you said Otherwise, he called that the sacrifice of fools when a man vows a vow, but he doesn't keep that vow to God. So we find here that all the days of his separation, he's not to eat anything, but all the days of the vow of his separation, there should no razor come up on his head. That tells, hey, they, they cut their hair very close. He, he, they talk about using a razor. You remember when Joseph when his, was uh, uh, in jail, you know, when he was in jail. Uh, when he got out, he shaved himself before he came before Pharaoh. He took care. And the reason being, nothing wrong with a beard, but Egyptians didn't wear beards as a general rule. They kept their faces shaven, so he shaved his face and shaved his head. But he said, until the days be fulfilled, verse number 5, in the which he separated himself unto the Lord, he shall be holy and shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. Well, you remember old uh, Samson had seven locks of hair. And when they shaved it off, it violated him as a Nazarite, but also re took his strength away from him. But the Philistines didn't figure out if his hair started to regrow again that the strength came back. Well, he took the temple down and killed more in his death than he did in his life. Uh, but we find the Nazarite, his hair was to grow. Verse number 6, All the days that he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. He couldn't be around anything that died, animal or human. Anything that was dead defiled him. Now he went on and said, He shall not, verse number 7, make himself unclean for his father, his mother, his brother, his sister, when they die because the consecration of his God is upon his head. He didn't get to come to their funerals. He didn't get to come around them 
because it would violate his separation. Verse 8, all the days of his separation, he's holy unto the Lord. Verse 9, he said, if any man die very suddenly by him. Boy, you know, sometimes you can't help yourself. You know, you're there and somebody just drops dead at your feet. Sometimes that massive heart attack, massive stroke, whatever it is, and there he is in close proximity to a dead body. It was not a fault of his own, but it still violated his separation. Now, notice what they say. If he defiles the head of his separation, in verse number 9, then he shall shave his head in the day of his cleansing. On the seventh day shall he shave it. Now, what he's got to do, he's got to start all over. But we find out it's not good time, it's bad time. If you read on down here, it says that the, he has to start over as a Nazarite. Right in the military, we called it bad time. I don't know if you were familiar with that. Somebody goes into a stockade for six months. That does not go toward time served. That's a bad time in the military. Now, I used to carry prisoners down to Mannheim, Germany. Uh, that's where the military stockade was uh, down there. And when they went in, if they went in for one year, two years, went to Leavenworth, wherever they went, uh, back in the States, that's bad time. It does not count as military service. And if you're in the military for two years as a draftee, it does not diminish the time that you're going to serve. If you're an RA, an RA was an enlisted man who enlisted himself, normally they start out with three years. I don't know what it is now, uh, but at that time an RA was three years. Uh, U.S., which was a draftee, was two years. Bad time. Now, what happens is he's lost all that time. If he told God, I'm going to give you ten years, and he's five years into that Nazarite vow. If that vow is broken and they have to shave his head, he owes God ten years. Wow, he goes right back and starts over. That's why they maintain their separation. Because you could get into a lifetime thing when it was supposed to be a temporary thing. Now, verse 10, on the eighth day he shall bring two turtles. What's a turtle? These are a turtle dove, all right? He didn't bring, I'm sorry, Miss Mildred, he didn't get a turtle, all right? He didn't bring, uh, uh, Brother Clifford came over, and I, when I got rid of my wood burner, I gave them some wood, and underneath that wood was a big old pretty terrapin, so when we got the truck loaded, I just set it up on top of the wood. And uh, when we, they got they got their Miss Mildred's, the one that stacked the wood, and there was her turtle. Well, they didn't get turtles. You hear the uh, voice of the turtle in the land. He's talking about a cooing of a dove, all right? So he brought either turtle do he brought two turtle doves or two young pigeons. Interesting what he has to bring to the Lord at this time for. That is what people brought that were in poverty. When they brought Jesus... To the priest, they brought two turtle doves or two pigeons because he was raised into a poor family. The carpenter's family didn't make a whole lot of money. They made a living. But they made him bring a poverty-type uh, offering to the Lord. He said, to the priest, the door of the tabernacle congregation. Look at verse 11. The priest shall offer the one for a sin offering, the other for a burnt offering, and make an atonement for him for that he sinned by the dead. Now, this was accidental. And yet the Bible said that he sinned by the dead. We don't see sin the way God, God sees sin. Boy, when you, when you look at, at sin itself, sin can be in several different areas. Uh, it can be sins of presumption, sins of innocence, sins of commission, omission, all different types. Uh, but there's sins of ignorance, folks. There's things we do every day that the law says is sin, but we're not conscious of it because we don't understand that part of the law. Now, if you're not conscious of sin, is it sin? It's still sin, folks. So what he did, it said he sinned. 
It was not something that he intended to do, that he wanted to do, but it's something that happened to him that broke the Nazarite law. That's why he is bringing <coughs> that, that sin. <coughs> Pardon me. For he has sinned by the dead and shall hallow his head that same day. Why? He's got to reconsecrate his head. They're going to shave that thing off. Verse number 12, And he shall consecrate unto the Lord the days of his separation. Now, he's got to go back and consecrate that days of his separation all over. He'll bring a lamb of the first year for a trespass offering. But the days that were before shall be lost. You see that? The days that were before, in verse 12, because his separation was defiled. Now it becomes bad time. He's got to start over and he's got to be separated again for the length of time that he was going to be separated. Verse 13, this is the law of the Nazarite when the days of his separation are fulfilled. Now, verse 13 through 21, we find he has fulfilled his time. He's done his time. I remember when I got out of the military, they required us to, uh, when I ets from Fort Dix, uh, New Jersey, that's normally where... He was coming in from Europe, and a lot of guys from Southeast Asia came into Fort Dix, New Jersey. Uh, we ETSed. We got out of the military there. But we had to remain in military uniform until we got off the plane at home. He wouldn't let me put civvies on when I came out of New Fort Dix, New Jersey. I still had military uh, a uniform on when I went to the airport. I flew out of Philadelphia, kept that uniform on, and actually until I got home, when I got off the uh, the plane at Louisville, Kentucky, and Barbara was there, I was still in military uniform. Till I got to the house, when I took it off, I never put it on again. Now, what he's talking about here, there's a time that that separation fulfilled. You say, well, what would have happened if you'd already ETS from the Army? They had given me a discharge from the Army, but I messed up on the way home. I was still under the uni uh, USM. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, uh, I like that, old JAG officers. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I, I was still under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, all right? Uh, Sometimes you lose the terminology. If I'd have messed up on the plane, if I'd have got drunk on the plane and slapped the stewardess and they put me in jail, uh, I would be, still go into a military jail. So that's what he's talking about here. So anyway, he's talking about now the days, of, hey, he's, he's fulfilled his time. He shall be brought under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now they're going to bring him around to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They do that. Verse 14, he shall offer his offering unto the Lord. One he lamb of the first year without blemish for a burnt offering. What's a burnt offering? Something that is totally consumed for God. All the time of his separation as a Nazarite, his life was totally consumed for God. He was a servant of the Lord all that time. So he brought a burnt offering to God showing that he had burnt out that time for God. He had fulfilled the purpose for which he was separate unto God. And then in verse number 14, and one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish for a sin offering. Why did he have to bring another sin offering? Because he may have sinned and not known it. Now, when a dead man fell down beside of him, all right, or whatever, and that defiled him, he knew that. But you know, a lot of times in our lives, folks, we are nothing but sinners saved by the grace of God. We live in sinful flesh. We sin all day long. We sin every day. Some of these people believe that uh, want, there's eventually the eradication of the old nature. That's why they say they're saved and then sanctified. Sanctified does mean set apart. Sanctified to them means they no longer sin. Filled with the Holy Ghost. They use these three terminologies a lot in Pentecostalism. I tell them, let's define your terms. I ask them, have you ever committed sin or do you still sin? They say, well, of course I'm a sinner. 
then your old nature is not eradicated. Listen, as long as you carry that body around, you need to understand that that body is wicked. Your heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. And the Bible said, who can know it? So we live in that. So what he did, he had to bring a sin offering for sins of ignorance, for sins of whatever reason. He still continued to bring them. I thank God that our trespass offering was Christ. He was totally consumed on the cross. And then our burnt offering and then our sin offering took away all our sin. So he had to bring these offerings. Notice what he said. And one ram without blemish for peace offering. Peace with God, peace of God. But it dealt, dealt with his relationship with God. I thank God that Christ was consumed. I thank God that Christ died for our sin and our sin is under the blood of Christ. Uh, but still, it, a peace offering has to do with your fellowship. It has to do with how you get along with God. Amen. Sometimes our, our soul gets disquieted within us. Three times in two chapters in the book of Psalm, he asked his soul, why art thou disquieted within me? I've, I've preached before on a disquieted soul, how you deal with a disquieted soul. But we find here that the, he brings a peace offering. Then verse 15, and a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour mingled with oil, and wafers of unleavened bread anointed with oil, and their meat offering and their drink offering. Now, that's a beautiful type of fellowship in peace. What did they do when they accepted somebody? Boy, when the angels of the Lord came to Abraham in Genesis chapter number 18, and he went and told them to be seated, and he brought them milk, and boy, they took the fatted calf, and they, hey, you're talking about taking a while to prepare a meal. They had to go out and kill and dress out that fatted calf. Then they had to cook that fatted calf and cook everything to bring. But they sat down together. It, it's, it, it speaks of fellowship of God's people. Somebody said Baptists eat a lot. I don't see anything wrong with that. Amen. I enjoy eating. It's a time of fellowship. You say, well, it's about food. No, it's about fellowship. When you sit around your table in the house, what is that? That's about fellowship. So he's talking about now he's going to bring a fellowship offering to the Lord. Verse 16, And the priest shall bring them before the Lord and shall offer his sin offering, his burnt offering. Verse 17, And he shall offer the ram for a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord with a basket of unleavened bread. The priest shall also uh, offer also his meat offering and his drink offering. That drink offering, uh, it's called a libation. Libation is something that you pour out before God. Uh, I guess one of the best biblical examples would be David when he said, Oh, that I had a drink of the wells of Bethlehem. You remember that? Three of his mighty men broke through the Philistine army and drew him some water out of that well. You talk about loving their leader, son. I mean, they risked their life for a drink of water. And then when they brought it back, they gave him that drink of water and he poured it out before the Lord. You remember when he did that? It's called a libation, all right? It's an offering of liquid that is given to God. I don't know if this was in the form of wine. It certainly was not in the form of strong drink of any type. But we find here that the drink offering. Verse 18, Then the Nazarite shall shave the head of his separation at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now he shaves his head. He's still standing at that gate. All the offerings have been made, and now he shaves. But he doesn't discard that hair. Notice what he does with the hair. And he shall take the hair of the head of his separation and put it in the fire which is under the sacrifice of the peace offerings. Now, he took that hair, but he didn't offer it with the sacrifices. What they had at the altar, they kept the fire underneath, and then they had a grate. And they burnt all of the offerings on the grate itself above the fire. 
He took that hair and put it underneath the offerings and burned it on the fire to let that smoke go up over the offerings. It's a beautiful type of his life being burnt out for God. And as they offered these to God, he offered that hair that showed the vows of his separation. And he said that he put all of that, hey, he burned it under there. Look at verse 19. And the priest shall take the sodden shoulder of the ram. The sodden shoulder of the ram means that it has been put in liquid. I... Uh, for what reason, uh, a lot of times for cooking it in that area, uh, a lot of this meat went to the priesthood from a lot of these offerings. It went to the priesthood. Uh, that's how they kept up the priesthood. They, when they brought all these offerings, they offered a part of it to God. The other went to the priesthood, but they took a solid shoulder, not a, not a ham, but a shoulder. Difference between the front two legs and the back two legs. This is the shoulder. They took that shoulder that was sodden and one unleavened cake out of the basket and one leavened wafer. He's taking them out of the basket. Why? Because they're going to eat the rest of it. They offered this and he said that they shall put them upon the hands of the Nazarite. Now, instead of giving all this to the priest, this actually would normally belong to the priest. They gave it to the Nazarite for him to feast off of. He's paid a price for his separation and sanctification. They took him out to the Chinese place for supper. All right. They, they fed him something, took him to, to the steakhouse. Boy, now we're going to reward you for what you've done. So we find here that he gives him... And then he would put them in the hands after the hair of his separation is shaven. Verse 20, the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. This is holy for the priest with the wave breast and the heave shoulder. And after that, the Nazarite may drink wine. Boy, for the first time in however many weeks, months, years, or whatever, he's able to drink of the fruit of the vine again. But... Grapes over in that area, they were very precious to them. Now, I know they, they grew a lot of grapes, but grape juice was used in festive uh, occasions more than it was just to sit down and drink. I don't find the Bible where somebody came to their house, they either gave them milk or water. They didn't give them grape juice because of how precious it was and what it was used for. You find... Uh, that wine or grape juice was at the wedding at Cana in chapter number 2 of the book of John. Uh, it was a festive uh, thing going on, so it, it was perfectly uh, good uh, to have it there. But now he's going to be able to drink wine again. Look at verse 21. We're going to finish just this for this morning. This is the law. This was not something up to their druthers. This was the law of the Nazarite who hath vowed and of his offering unto the Lord for separation beside that that his hands shall get according to the vow which he vowed so he must do after the law of his separation. So we find that now he has fulfilled that vow. Uh, in the New Testament I guess the, the Nazarite that I would think of would be John the Baptist uh, John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. Didn't say he was filled with the Holy Ghost and saved from his mother's womb. John the Baptist was just like any other child. There needed to be a time to where he put his personal faith in Jesus Christ. He had, he had to do that or the coming of the Messiah at that point in time. But he was still the last of the Old Testament prophets. Even though you find John the Baptist in the New Testament, he was the voice of one crying in the wilderness, making straight the path of the Lord. He was an Old Testament prophet. You look at his life. Hey, look at what he ate. His separation, his food, locust and wild honey. It, it, he was separated in his life and the way he dressed and the way he carried himself. And I would say that probably he was a Nazarite 
unto God. He has all the qualifications of it that's found in the New Testament that he said he must do after the law of his separation. Once you vowed to God, you were committed to God. Now, when you were committed to God, you were committed to separation. Why do a lot of people not want to serve God? Because it will cost you something. It's going to cost you something. You know, salvation will cost you something. I thank God when I got saved, I gave up the normal things. But you know, some people's lives are so, so messed up. And they're going to have to give up some big things if they get saved. And they understood that. I'll give you an example. Uh, when I worked at uh, uh, last mine, I worked at Retiki in Henderson, Kentucky. Uh, I was witnessing to a face boss there. I'm not even going to give his name because somebody listening this morning may know his name. I witnessed to him and witnessed to him and witnessed to him and witnessed to him. Boy, and I mean, you could see the conviction on him. Every time he turned around, I'd have him by myself and I'd just tell him, hey, you need to be saved. And finally one day he got under so much conviction, you need to understand top was about that high. As fast as he could run underground, he ran away from me about 20 feet and stopped with his back to me. And he turned around and I called him by his name and I told him, I said, what's the matter? He said, if I get saved, I'm, I'm going to have to tithe. And he said, I cannot afford to tithe. He just about bought a big high dollar brick home back in those days, big trucks, big everything else. And I, and I told him, I said, you just need to get saved. But he understood something. It was going to cost him something. And he wasn't willing to pay the price. Barbara and I were talking about that this morning. Not him, but another scenario that I'm dealing with right now. Uh, where to cost you? You remember the rich young ruler? The Bible said he ran and fell on his knees before Christ said, good master, what good thing should I do in order to be saved? And I'm kind of paraphrasing. The Lord said, well, you've got to honor your mother and your father and gave all these things. He said, all these things have I kept from my youth. He said, what do I lack? The Lord said, you go sell all that you have and give to the poor and come follow me. Now, why did he do that? Because he knew the heart of the young man. He knew that heart was not willing to give his life to the Lord. He, that part, he, he was very rich. He was a rich young ruler. And the Bible said that he went away sorrowfully. I preached a message one time, running to Christ to be saved and going away lost. God was going to require something of him. Salvation has a price tag to it. Somebody said, what did it cost you? It cost you the world. Amen. Not that you had to give the world up to be saved, but I'll tell you what, you get saved, it'll cost you the world. It's going to cost you a whole lot of things in order to come to Christ. In the same way with these Nazarites, but when they gave a vow to God, it had an expense with it. And once they completed that, there was a way to become a Nazarite, then God had a way in which you were no longer a Nazarite on the other end. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for the day. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the word of God this morning. Lord, Old Testament principles of a Nazarite, uh, they apply to our lives today as God's children. I pray you'd bless the service to come. Uh, give uh, Terry and Chris uh, safety on the road today. Just be with our people, and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Going to